Give us a couple of more seconds to make sure everyone is on. We're already above 200, but I want to wait a little bit longer to make sure everyone is on before we start. All right, let's get started. My name is Trita Parsi. Uh, welcome to the Quincy Institute's panel discussion on Trump's Iran policy, maximum pressure or maximum failure. I'm Trita Parsi. I'm the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute, a think tank in Washington that promotes ideas that move US foreign policy away from endless war and toward vigorous diplomacy. And diplomacy was the big winner when the United States, Russia, China and the E3 struck a hard-won nuclear deal with Iran back in 2015. Back then, there were a lot of folks that were worried that the Iranians at some point would breach the deal, but it turned out that ultimately it was the United States under Trump that abandoned or betrayed the agreement. Uh, in May 2018, Trump left the deal and adopted a policy called maximum pressure, essentially sanctions on steroids, ostensibly to force the Iranians to renegotiate a new deal with Trump himself. But he also promised to roll back Iran's influence in the region, secure the release of all Americans imprisoned in Iran, and completely eliminate all of Iran's enrichment activities. Two years later, Iran has increased its nuclear activities. The US and Iran have at least on two occasions been only minutes away from a full-scale war. And according to the Trump administration itself, Iran's regional activities are more problematic now than they were before. While Trump keeps escalating his sanction, it is no longer clear as to whether the goal now is a new negotiation or whether it is to push matters towards war or perhaps simply to pursue a scorched earth strategy to ensure that no future administration will be able to resurrect diplomacy with Tehran, let alone revive the nuclear deal. So is the nuclear deal uh, capable of being resurrected? Could diplomacy restart perhaps even in a Trump two administration? And if Joe Biden becomes president next year, what options and pathways will he have at his disposal? And where is Iran on all of this? What are its options and its likely um, uh, path of action mindful of the tensions with the United States? And perhaps most importantly, the question that almost never get asked in Washington is how does the Iran issue fit into the larger question facing the United States in the Middle East, such as ending the endless war in Afghanistan, whether to stay or leave Iraq, and to achieve what the American public increasingly seems to want, which is a US military drawdown from the Middle East. We have an excellent panel with us today to discuss all of these issues. But before I introduce them, let me first remind everyone if you are watching this on Zoom, please make sure that you use the Q&A function to ask your questions and we will get to those questions throughout the conversation. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure that you put your questions in the comment section and we will get to those as well. So without any further ado, let me bring in the panelists and start the conversation. First, we have Jared Blanc, who currently is at the Carnegie Endowment but who previously was the deputy lead coordinator for Iran nuclear implementation under President Obama. Part of his responsibility was to the full and effective implementation of the nuclear deal. And ever since leaving government, he has emerged as one of the main voices in the US-Iran debate here in Washington. Negar Mortazavi is an Iranian American journalist and media analyst for The Independent, BBC and Al Jazeera. She has been covering Iran, the greater Middle East and US foreign policy for more than a decade. She has been recognized for her work by numerous institutions and entities, including The Guardian, who named her one of the top 10 people to follow on Twitter for Iran related matters. Last but not least, we are delighted to have Barry Posen, who is a professor at, uh, of political science at MIT. He has written numerous books, but the one that I will plug here today is Restraint, a new foundation for US grand strategy. Posen is considered one of the main architects of this alternative grand strategy, which would entail a significant rehaul of American foreign policy 
away from global military domination. Full disclosure, restraint is the intellectual bedrock of the Quincy Institute, but that is also why we are so delighted to have Professor Posen with us here today. So let's get started. Let me first go to you, Jarrett, and ask you, you were implementing this deal, both on the American and on the Iranian side, making sure that the Iranians were supposed to be doing what they were doing. Progress was made, uh, milestones were achieved. All of that has now been unraveled, but the Trump administration says that by leaving the deal, they have actually achieved more and, and made America more safe and uh, pushed back Iran's nuclear program further than what the deal would have done. Two years after Trump leaving the deal, what is your uh, balance sheet assessment of what maximum pressure has achieved and what it has not achieved? Well, Trita, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the generous introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with such a distinguished panel. Um, the, the balance sheet is fairly straightforward. Uh, the only complication that I'll, I'll add is to say that it's, we need to evaluate the success or failure of maximum policy uh, based on two questions. There's the purported objectives of the policy, and then I think the real and obvious objectives of the policy. Um, the, it's a tale of two failures. They failed in both counts, but it's good news in one respect and bad news in another. So let's start with the, the bad news and the purported objectives of the policy. The Trump administration laid out, I think outlandish promises about what they could achieve vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Changes in Iran's nuclear posture, changes in Iran's ballistic missile posture, regional posture, and kind of sotto voce also domestic human rights situation. Um, those of us who had spent some time negotiating uh, with Tehran believed from the beginning that these were unachievable objectives, that they mixed uh, categories of things that were sort of critical to Iran's national security thinking and things that were not in a way that the U.S. simply couldn't advance using principally economic pressure alone. And I think that's obviously been the case. And really across the board, as you've already uh, very well laid out, Trita, across the board, there has been um, e either more problems or at, or at best in a handful of cases, kind of the status quo. There certainly has not been any progress. The, that's with the purported objective of the policy. The real objective of the policy, I would say, was crisis and conflict, um, because nobody could have credibly believed that with sort of less leverage, we could achieve a great deal more than had already been won through the JCPOA. And so there had to be, there has to be a different explanation for the policy. And here's where the failure is kind of good news, because while there certainly has been crisis and there certainly has been conflict, it has been dramatically less, I think, than the art architects of this policy anticipated uh, when they began to implement it three years ago. The fact is the JCPOA is still half alive. Um, Euro our European friends and allies have done remarkably well to keep the thing on life support. And the Iranians have sh demonstrated tactical restraints in a number of areas that has allowed sort of a, a, a vision of a possible end game, uh, either under a new US administration or potentially a modified Trump second term administration. So, so you've got these two failures, the failure to achieve any real national security objectives with Iran, bad news, and the failure to achieve uh, crisis and war, good news. Very interesting, uh, Jared. And, and when you say that, you know, you're kind of questioning as to whether these public objectives really are the case that they're actually moving this towards the conflict. This is similar to what you wrote in a recent article, Barry, in which you said that, you know, we shouldn't take at face value uh, the administration's statement that they don't want war because they're certainly moving closer to it and they seem to be courting it. I think those were the exact words that you were Absolutely. using. Um, if this leads to uh, a military confrontation, how will that affect America's other geopolitical rivals, competitors? Uh, because we have seen in the last 20, 25 years how other states have benefited from the fact that the US has uh, entangled itself in, in the Middle East. And particularly today, when the Trump administration is taking a very aggressive path towards China, how will that affect China, Russia, and other countries that the US otherwise says it's very concerned about yet at the same time is putting such a high priority on confrontation with Iran? Well, you know, a lot depends on how such a, a, a war would go. Um, I think perhaps wrongly, uh, uh, people sort of tend to think that the war would somehow be quick because the Americans would have a long list of targets and they would magically destroy those targets and then the war would somehow stop. 
uh, and then you know it's on to the next thing. Uh, but Iran's a big country, and whether or not there's an initial wave of fighting that stops or persists, there can be huge tensions afterwards. So it seems quite likely that um, the, uh, the co a conflict itself and whatever its aftermath looks like is going to fix America's attention, the United States' attention on the region, and also suck a lot of resources into the region as you're trying to deter any kind of new outbreak of uh, uh, Iranian uh, challenge or anything like that. So on balance, it's, it's going to, it's probably going to suck some, you know, certainly some attention, but also some capability away from other things. Uh, and it forces you to kind of use the capability. One of our problems in recent years is that whether we're fighting or not fighting, we're always on guard, we're always sailing, we're always flying, we're always inspecting. This has the effect of grinding up the force, right? And then you have to pay a lot of money to fix it back up. So the whole thing will be a resource sink, uh, holding aside all the sad things that will be associated with the conflict, various ramifications for allies, whether they like you more or less afterwards, close allies, distant allies. There's also just the fact that, you know, it's hard to really pay a lot of attention to this part of the world and also pay attention to some other part of the world. That is the record, as you mentioned, and I think we have reason to fear that it, that would be the record again. Um, Nagar, if, you know, as Jared pointed out, what it has and what it hasn't achieved, one thing it does seem to have achieved is that the idea of diplomacy and negotiations with the United States that previously was quite supported by the American public, uh, by the Iranian public, and was increasingly gaining um, uh, acceptance within the Iranian elite, which otherwise, of course, had resisted it. Now, it seems to be a rather discredited position to make the case for diplomacy with the United States mindful of what has happened. Is that a temporary thing? Can you see the situation in Iran changing in a positive direction in which the Iranians would be more open to diplomacy? Or is this gonna have a much longer uh, set damage on the ability of the Iranian political establish establishment to come around with the idea of diplomacy with the US? Thank you for the introduction and hello to everyone. Um, I think to some extent it could be temporary because the Iranians are watching US politics very closely and they definitely do make a distinction between the Trump administration or even Republicans, Democrats or a potential Biden presidency after. But then at the same time, the fact that President Trump quickly pulled out of such an important agreement after years of hard work by a previous administration, I think that surprised everyone, not just the hardliners, but also the Democrats and the pro diplomacy camp in Iran. It surprised, I would say it surprised the world. And it wasn't just the Iran deal that President Trump um, did this to, but the credibility of the pro diplomacy voice in Iran, the pro engagement um, party, it, it just shrank their credibility. Basically the hardliners proving the hardliners right that look, we told you all these years, all these 40 years, the United States is not to be trusted. We can't trust them. Their signature doesn't mean anything. Their deal making doesn't mean anything. But then at the same time, I still think there's this understanding in Tehran that this is one administration and then another administration could be different. Maybe the deal making could be a little bit different with more focus on the US Congress because in the previous um, process, the Iranians completely uh, ignored the Congress part as a domestic issue. And now they're starting to understand that when, for example, Republican congressmen wrote a letter to Tehran saying, don't negotiate with this president because we're going to unravel it, maybe they had a point after all and everyone laughed at them then, but uh, no longer. But then I still want to, uh, going back to the point Jared was making, I think the deal is very much alive, maybe half alive or on life support, but it's not completely dead. And Tehran, surprisingly, is prepared um, to rejoin the deal. So let's say under a potential Biden presidency. So depending on um, how the elections unfold in the US, who stays president in the White House, or even if this administration changes policy, I think the view in Tehran is not going to be set on stone, but the overall um, look of an administration, of a US administration basically unraveling an agreement that was just made a uh, short while before they came into power, that just diminished the credibility of, of the deal making of the United States as a as an whole. And also it weakened the argument of the pro-engagement camp in Iran. Um, 
Jared, if if Negar is right, and you know, I think you would agree that at the end of the day, the deal remarkably is alive, partly because of what the Europeans have done, but perhaps mostly because the Iranians stuck to it, even though they've increasingly got very, very little uh, for remaining in the deal. But given that, which means that after all of these sanctions and all of the efforts, the Trump administration actually has not managed to kill the deal. It seems like some of the latest maneuvers, whether it is to uh, snap back sanctions at the Security Council, arms embargo, um, et cetera, may be the last chance. But if that is the path that is pursued, which seems very likely, how do you think it will play out? What are the objectives and what are the likely outcomes if the Trump administration suddenly goes back to the Security Council and says, you know, we never really left the deal, so we still want to uh, uh, use the ability to snap back sanctions on Iran? Right. Well, first of all, you're exactly right that the 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 game at foot at the at the Security Council is not about the arms embargo. If the United States were genuinely concerned about arms shipments to or from Iran, there are a variety of diplomatic tools that we would use to try to to uh, limit the strategic implications of those potential sales. Um, the last thing that we would do would be to make a big fuss and try to embarrass the Russians, who are the principal possible sellers of these materials to Iran, um, in public. Uh, the, the, the game with the arms embargo and snapback is about trying to shatter the remaining shell of the JCPOA um, in order to bot in a potential future Biden administration, make it more difficult for them uh, to re-enter the JCPOA as the vice president has promised, has laid out it would be his policy to do if elected. Um, so there are two ways that, that could happen. The first way that it could happen would be um, to provoke you know, such a powerful response from Iran that essentially there's nothing left. So for example, Iranian withdrawal from the NPT, something that Iranian leaders and diplomats have mooted at various points over the past couple of years. That's possible if and it happens, there's you know, really nothing more that an advocate of the deal like myself could probably say. I think it's quite unlikely though, because the Iranians as, as you and I have both sort of suggested have been I'm pretty careful so far to try to keep some, some vision of the deal alive. And I think it's unlikely that they would lose sight of that objective in the final months before the US presidential election. The second thing that you could do with snapback at the Security Council is basically destroy the, 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 the UN legal structure of the deal, UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2231, which would, which would then make, so that it's no longer really a bilateral matter between the United States and Iran, how do we go back into compliance with the deal, but now a much more complicated one where the Russians and the Chinese um, could demand some kind of recompense for what they perceive to be you know, US cheating on the deal. Um, and that would make it much more difficult potentially for a, a President Biden to go back in. Again, it's not at all clear to me that the administration is gonna be able to succeed here because there is at very least ambiguity as to whether or not the United States is capable of implementing snapback. And so depending on the reaction of our European friends and allies of Russia and China, it might well be that you've got either a failed snapback or a contested snapback, which leaves the, the field open for an incoming President Biden to say, like our European friends, we don't think that what President Trump here did here was legal or legit legitimate and we reject it and we're gonna go back to the JCPOA. So, I think it's clear that the, this, is the, this is the administration's game, but as with so many things in the last three years, whether or not they've actually figured out the formula and can really kill this thing once and for all, I think is very much an open question. Two follow-ups on that. Uh, one more on the technicality of this, because you said that if they succeed with a snapback, uh, you know, the next administration would have a hard time uh, reconstituting, but actually, Let's say they succeed with a snapback, but there's only a couple of months left and then the new administration comes in. What is to stop the Biden administration to support the reintroduction of that same resolution as it stands, perhaps without the snapback this time, and, and readopt it? Well, nothing um, except the requirement of actually getting uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council to vote for it. And so I think what you end up then is especially given the fact that you've got a time horizon of the Iranian presidential election coming up, rather than, a, I think, a fairly straightforward process of getting the United States and Iran in, back into mutual compliance with the JCPOA, <coughs> you have inherently a negotiation, and not just that, but a multi-party negotiation, where I don't think some of the other parties are going to have any particular interest in, in making our policy objectives easier for us to achieve. And so, um, 
it, it's possible. It's just much, much more difficult than the situation that we have today and that I hope we'll have um, in, in November, which is that really it's just a question of the United States and Iran finding an agreement about a, 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 a way to come back into mutual compliance with the deal. Um, on that point, I want to ask this of you, Bar uh, Barry. Um, we're talking about a snapback in the Security Council, significant tensions with Russia, China, the other EU states, because we're kind of, you know, undermining the Security Council as a whole. So this is not just about the Iran deal. It's not just about U.S.-Iran relations. It's kind of making a mockery of the entire institution. Um, so it seems like we're giving you know, the idea of just killing this Iran deal, such an amazing priority that we're willing to risk all of these other things, all of these other tensions with other major powers. Um, and it raises the question, why is this so important from a pure US national interest perspective? Is it so critical to be able to push back? And I wanna bring in a question that kind of touches on this from one person in the audience, Milt Lowenstein from New Hampshire asks, how does limiting Iran's influence in its part of the world benefit the American people? Well, the first thing I, th I think you have to have, uh, by way of background here, is that I'm not sure the Trump administration actually sees the costs as having the same value that you are seeing the costs. Um, they don't have that big interest in multilateralism. They don't have a big belief in the efficacy of international institutions. Uh, they believe that international politics is inherently conflictual and that, you know, your win is my loss and vice versa. So the cost of, you know, that you've suggested is just not a cost that they see as very high. Now, we could stand back ourselves and just ask the question, how do we feel about it? Which is, um, does it seem like Iran, you know, and, and um, the kinds of uh, concessions that the Trump administration wants out of Iran, does this matter as much as some other things that we could think about? I mean, even if you're a kind of a hard-bitten realist, you know, geo-strategist, uh, is whether or not, or not Iran is, uh, you know, 12 months away from sufficient fissionable material to have a nuclear weapon, or six months, or 18 months, is, does this, in turn, and all the energy is required to to accomplish this, and similarly with Iranian missiles, does this weigh heavily relative to, say, dealing with the rise of China? And I don't want to take refuge in China threat inflation as a way to get out of the Middle East, but it is just a fact that China is a much more capable state, and it's advancing its interests, and our interests in theirs are not always coincident. So, and this is a big problem, because China is a really great power. Uh, Russia is still a kind of a problem in Europe. It's much weaker than it once was, but it's strong enough to make trouble. So you've got these other things and we only have so many resources to commit. It's hard to see why you would focus so much on Iran. I mean, there's really only three interests you could see in the Middle East. One is the proliferation interest and we the Obama administration got some leverage on that at a relatively modest cost. Uh, it wasn't all the leverage that some people would like, but it was a lot of leverage for a low cost. Uh, risk of a hegemon in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think Iran is really strong enough to become a hegemon in the Middle East, even if the United States isn't active, but it's not so hard to prevent them from establishing that degree of dominance. It doesn't require a, you know, a war. And then the third issue is the issue that we seem to actually be trading off against, which many people will sometimes cite. I often forget about it, uh, which is the, the problem with terror originating in, in, in the politics of the Middle East. Uh, it's clear that some of the, you know, you know, the resurgence of the confrontation with Iran has had some effect on dampening the campaign against the, the, the Islamic State. Now, it's not the only problem, but it is a problem, right? So there's a lot of things that are being traded off to have this focus on Iran. And um, I think the, the, the question that was asked, you know, by the individual from, I guess, up my neck of woods here in New England, uh, um, is right, which is, you know, how, how important is this is this area really? Even if you take these interests as important relative to others, do they merit all the attention that they're getting? And I don't really see how they do.
What do you think about that, Jared, from uh, someone who was in U.S. government? Oh, I, I don't know that I could agree any more strongly <laughs> with anything. It, the, to me, it seems that the, the, the fundamental problem with U.S. policy toward Iran has been a ridiculous inflation of Iran's importance to the United States. Um, you don't have to excuse a variety of genuinely problematic Iranian policies, either domestically or in the region, to say this is not actually a particular threat to the United States. And the, the, the way in which it becomes a threat to the United States is largely through our own mistakes, right? We, um, by, by making them more important than we are, we create problems for ourselves. And we should really, um, we, should, we should much more often take a pose of sort of studied indifference, rem remembering that we are a superpower and they are a regional power in a highly contested region. Um, in, in that context of, you know, really inflating their importance, uh, the threat that they can pose, you know, where does our interest end and the interest of some of the U.S.'s partners in the region begin? Uh, one thing we constantly hear um, from those who are advocating a tougher stance is that the regime is about to implode. The regime is about to implode. And we're seeing some rather comic but still sad images right now in which um, senior people in the Iranian government are uh, mocking the United States or criticizing the United States because of the protests that are currently taking place here. But the Iranian government still has a tremendous amount of internal problems. They had their own uh, protests not too long ago. Quite a few number of people were killed. They have even admitted it now, so it's not even disputed. But is it about to fall, uh, mindful of the tremendous economic pressure that has been put on them and, and their own incompetence and, and um, corruption, Negar, I'm sure you constantly hear that they're about to fall, but what is your sense, your conversations with people on the ground? Um, is it yet another case of a uh, uh, false alarm or is it something more serious this time around? Well, I think part of the administration or some in Washington listen to Iranian exile more than they should. And the exiles have been talking about the imminent collapse of the regime for the past four decades, frankly. Um, you know, it's hard to, 100% predict the future, things can happen unforeseen. But um, I don't see anything that is um, threatening the existence of the entire system any more than eight years of war with Iraq was. Post-Iranian revolution, very young state, not so strong, eight years of devastating war on Iranian soil, and they still survived. They have survived years of oppression internally, they have um, expanded um, their reach across the region with um, proxies, with um, some of their friends and allies. And um, I think on the one hand, this um, overhyping Iran's power and Iran's importance doesn't go very much hand in hand. In fact, it contradicts the notion that the regime is about to collapse any minute or any day or, you know, as some in the administration would like to see and some exiles are ready to go and take over right after this regime has gone. Um, but the, all of these policies and these movements and changes do have an impact on Iran's domestic issues. Um, the political space has closed up much more in the past couple of years in Iran. Civil society has been repressed a lot more. As you mentioned, recent protests was massively, there was a massive crackdown on protesters, security forces shooting at protesters, hundreds killed. Um, there was also the downing of the civilian plane, the Ukrainian flight on the night that Iran was trying to retaliate for the killing of the Iranian general Hassan Soleimani, and they went around and shot their own uh, a civilian plane in their own airspace, killing 170 people. These are major crises that the, uh, the system is dealing with. But the result of that, as we see, and as we've seen in the past, is just a more closing up of the political space, more repression on any kind of dissent, framing anyone as a mouthpiece for the Trump administration, a mouthpiece for Netanyahu. And as we just saw in the um, very recent parliamentary elections, a consolidation of power by the hardliners. They grabbed most of the seats in the Iranian parliament. You have an IRGC, a former IRGC commander, Mohammad Baghir Ghalibov now sitting uh, soon sitting as the speaker of the parliament. And this consolidation of power can very, uh, very well continue if this maximum pressure continues and if Trump 
stays in the White House without any kind of change or shift in his policy towards Iran. We can very well see a hardliner become president after Rouhani ends his term, and then almost another decade of what we witnessed under Ahmadinejad, the kind of back and forth that never led to anything until, um, because the presidency in Iran obviously would probably most likely be two terms, so another eight years with this hardline parliament, with another hardline president. But if a Biden presidency starts, then that could shift things around. There's still some few months for the moderates and the reformists in Iran to regroup and maybe um, be able to make a comeback for the upcoming presidential election. Thank you, Nigar. I, I want to get general. Sorry, go ahead, Jared. The general comment, which is that, look, unlike Nigar, I'm not anything like an expert on Iranian domestic politics. But I've worked in a bunch of countries around the world, a bunch of the US's conflicts around the world, in the Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. And one thing that I take away from those experiences is that we are not very good at playing other countries' politics. And God knows Iran, where we haven't had a diplomat in two decades, the idea that we are, as a government, well positioned to assess and analyze the internal politics of the country, not only to make predictions about what's going to come, but to manipulate what's going to come. Um, I mean, it's belied by the fact that, as I said earlier, we haven't even been able to manipulate them into the kind of sort of outrageous violations of the JCPOA that would have pushed the Europeans out of the deal. We need to be much, much more modest about our ability to influence other countries' domestic politics and take much more of that as sort of, you know, a given that we respond to rather than, um, you know, a, a something that we have a capacity to play with. Very interesting. Um, you know, a lot of bad news in the last couple of years uh, when it comes to the domestic situation in Iran, uh, how the deal is going, tensions between the United States and Iran. But every once in a while, there are also these small points of hope that makes you wonder that perhaps something else may be happening behind the scene or could be happening behind the scenes. Sune Rasmussen, uh, who is with the Wall Street Journal, asked, how do the panelists view today's release of Michael White following the release on Tuesday of Cyrus Askari in light of the evolving US-Iran relations? Are we seeing a detente that might stick or are prisoner exchanges and military tensions completely separate issues? Why don't we start off with you, Negar? Uh, how do you see this, re this release and why? You know, there's some interesting politics taking place. There's a lot of different Americans that are held in Iran right now. Um, and it's not necessarily that the person that has been held the longest is the first in line to get out. Um, Siamak Namazi, Bogan Namazi are still there. Michael White was released now. We had the Chinese American released last year. How do you see this and does it interplay with this tension or is it completely separate? Well, it's just one little area of opening that um, we could see in the past year or so since the Iranians came out about that very publicly because we know under the negotiations with the Obama administration, the prisoner swap was happening in parallel the negotiations, but in very secret, under very secret circumstances. This time around, there's a change um, of, of policy in Tehran. It seems like the Iranian foreign minister came out very publicly and said that he's prepared and he has the authority to do a prisoner swap. There's been so much back and forth, the US putting the blame on the Iranian side, saying they don't want to do it. Iranians saying they're prepared. The US is not responding. Anyways, we saw the, I would say indirect exchange of, um, as you said uh, a while ago, of two prisoners, basically one each side letting the other go without making it into a big prisoner swap situation. And then the same thing happened this week with the Iranian scientist um, who was let go by the US and also Michael White who was freed by Iran today. So I think it's a small window of opening it's important to note that this is only successful with the help of interlocutors. This is only uh, possible because the Swiss helped this happen. It's not something that the Trump administration could directly do with Iran, and that could probably be a good lesson for the administration and if they want to do any more openings on the other side. But I don't think, at least in the next few months that's left from this administration, that Tehran is prepared for any more any major diplomatic openings with this administration, because this would, from their view, this would give a winning card, um, at least in the diplomatic uh, sphere to President Trump that could possibly help him for re-election. I don't think there's going to be much uh, change in the policy from Tehran, except for maybe uh, more prisoner swaps like this. I wouldn't use the word detente. Uh, I think it's, it probably has something to do with uh, trying to dampen down the potential for escalation to a conflict 
violent conflict right now that neither side actually wants um, because of the uh, COVID-19 in both countries' problems, because of both countries' economic problems, um, because of America's own domestic political problems at this moment. Uh, I don't think we really want the fight. I mean, it may be that six months ago, the Trump administration was full of uh, you know, vinegar, but uh, now I'm guessing that they probably don't want the fight. And I also suspect that the Iranians don't want the fight either. So this is a way, I think it's more likely that this is a kind of downward pressure relative to where it could go, rather than it is the beginning of something new. I was flipping through some press cup clippings, and apparently the American military in the region sent a kind of condolence note to the Iranians about the, the deaths the Iranians suffered in the accidental destruction of their own ship when they were testing a weapon. This struck me as being very odd, and I'm guessing it has to do with the same thing. There's just a little bit of, you know, let's just, you know, let's both pull back here now for a while. Very interesting. Um, I want to. We have a lot of questions about what a potential Biden presidency uh, would mean for the possibility or the potential for negotiations. But before I go there, I wanted to ask you, Barry, something. Um, as a proponent of restraint, uh, and I've, you, you already made it clear during this conversation, the degree of American military presence in the region really is not warranted by U.S. national interests. Uh, there is no uh, indigenous hegemon that can take it over, and most other potential hegemons are perhaps clever enough not wanting to be the hegemon of the Middle East. Now, getting out of the Middle East in that sense, however, is not necessarily as easy as it sounds. And Jake Sullivan and Daniel Benayim, uh recently wrote a very interesting piece in Foreign Affairs. And Jake Sullivan, of course, and Daniel himself are, are um, uh, close to uh, Vice President Biden. They wrote, ultimately, finding a more constructive approach with Iran is essential to the sustainable redeployment of US forces from the region. From your perspective, Barry, is it a necessary step to find some sort of a modus vivendi with Iran before the US can extract itself from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria? Or um, uh, is this um, uh, not as important as sideshow, or should we be careful not to make some form of modus vivendi with Iran a precondition for a uh, military drawdown from the Middle East? Yeah, well, you're you're into kind of inside the Beltway politics of foreign policy, and I I can't I, I can't really be sure what the purpose of this argument is. I I. I I do think that um, the United States could simply resolve not to press its interests in the Persian Gulf to the point of war. Now, this is, you know, uh, a kind of a red flag to um, many students of American diplomacy. You know, the all options are on the table is the way. Um, uh, American diplomats like to talk about uh, negotiations. Um, but the United States has plenty of levers in play to influence Iran in the general direction that we want on some limited issues. It was achieved in the, uh, in the JCPOA. Hopefully the JCPOA could, could, JCPOA could be resurrected in some, in some way. But I, I do think that the United States has to decide whether the, the wars that it's in and the wars that it's sometimes threatened are really worth the, the cost right now. The Americans are very strong, so these wars tend not to end up looking like Korea, but Iraq was bad enough. Afghanistan was, was bad enough. And um, uh, it's really hard to get your way with war. War is a blunt instrument. I, I, you know, I have supported some wars in the past, and I think America needs a strong military, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but is this a tool that you really want to use in this part of the world? Has it worked out well for us? Right? So in this part of the world, I would say, think about what your interests actually are. Value those interests relative to other interests and relative to the cost of pursuing them with war. And I think if you do that, you decide, well, you know, maybe you can't get out of the area entirely from a diplomatic point of view. Maybe you even can't get out of the, idea, the area entirely from the point of view of some kinds of security guarantees to some kinds of actors about some kinds of contingencies. But I think you could reduce your presence there a lot. And I think we could 
a lot of it is on us. I think we have to practice restraint in this part of the world. It's very tempting to think you can have once and for all solutions to particular problems if you only intervene militarily. And it's very tempting to think that you can stay and sit on a problem like we're, we're, we seem to be intent on doing in Iraq and that this can be done on an open-ended basis. Uh, I don't think there's a very good reason to believe this is the case. Um, uh, things change, locals get tired of you, somebody makes a mistake, something changes here. Uh, and then the, the, the costs that you spent turn out to be simply sunk costs. They're not an investment the way some people like to think of it. It's just a sunk cost. And at some point you will liquidate it anyway. So my view is we just, you have to think a little bit more strategically. And I think that's what you've been hinting at in many of your questions, which is what's the valuation of the stakes relative to other stakes? What's the valuation of the stakes or the interest um, relative to what it costs to pursue those interests with military power? What's our own condition at the moment for doing this kind of thing? Um, I think if you set the bar high for exit from the region, or at least for major reduction in, the, in our presence in the region, to sort of some sort of modus vivendi with Iran, and someone starts defining the modus vivendi, and sooner or later the definition comes down to the Trump administration's maximal demands. A modus vivendi means no Iranian nuclear weapons program, a really controlled energy program, no missile program, a much reduced Iranian Republican Guard Corps, very limited intelligence operations, no alliances with proxies, and then th then you can have the modus vivendi. Well, you're never getting out of there because you're basically saying to Iran, defend everything that you've built that you believe is the shield of your republic. We used to call U.S. foreign policy the shield of our republic. For good or ill, Iran believes that all these tools are the shield of their republic, their Islamic republic, and you're just not going to get them to give them all up. And if that becomes the ingredients of a modus vivendi, it really just becomes a permanent obstacle to changing your policy in the region. So uh, certainly uh, resolving everything would put some sort of an impossible bar, not just to fixing U.S.-Iran relations, but getting uh, to a point of American drawdown, but the opposite, constantly heightening the tensions between the US and Iran is a very effective way of keeping the United States in, in the region. And a potential President Biden is going to have to deal with not only that issue, but also whether to walk in into the nuclear deal again, how to do so, um, just a straight uh, rejoining or a renegotiation is going to be a lot of complications. And Robert Einhorn, who was one of the negotiators in the Obama administration, asks, Iran was disillusioned by the JCPOA's sanctions relief. Would it want simply to return to the JCPOA? Wouldn't it want to do better, just as the US would like a better, at a minimum, on the sunsets type of a deal? Uh, what do you think of that, Jared? Do you think, first of all, is the political pressure on the uh, Biden administration such that they need to negotiate a new deal in order to be able to rejoin? And if that's the case, what is their, how is their position really different from the Trump administration's, at least public position? And uh, will there perhaps be a renegotiation anyways? Because as Bob points out, perhaps the Iranians are terribly unhappy about how the sanctions relief work, but also potentially getting away with the sunset, uh, the, the, the snapback. You're on mute, Jared. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, for, let me start with the United States and then Ron. So on, on the United States side, I mean, whatever sort of theories people have about how a new Democratic administration would approach the JCPOA, it seems to me that Vice President Biden has been admirably clear and repeatedly over the course of the primary campaign. His stated policy is that the United States and, and Iran both return to compliance with the JCPOA. So while there's been some debate, I think, about whether or not that there, you know, you should start with, with another kind of deal, a more for more deal, um, that's not what he said. And my expectation is that if the Iranians are willing to, to, uh, to go along with that and to return to mutual compliance with the JCPOA, that that's the starting point. Um, so then the question is, are they, would the Iranians be willing to do that? Or as Bob isn't, you know, correctly pointed out, they've never been entirely satisfied with the sanctions relief that was provided under under the JCPOA. So would they hold out for more? And you know, here I really I defer, I think, to Nagara, but I would say that I I'm a little skeptical of the argument that um, Iran would sort of look at the prospect of 
immediate, if incomplete, sanctions relief, and certainly the resumption of international oil sales, and say, you know, rather than take that right now and then deal with middle middle term problems over the middle term, we are going to accept continued sanctions now and try to hold out for a more for more deal as a first step. So it seems to me that the strategic logic on both sides and the clear stated policy of Vice President Biden is you start with mutual return to the JCPOA and then you start talking about the things that both sides are dissatisfied with about in the deal, including for, from our perspective, kind of what future restrictions there might be on an Iranian nuclear program or controls on an Iranian nuclear program. And from the Iranian perspective, um, you know, the, the aspects of sanctions re relief that did not live up to their expectations. Do you think a Biden administration, uh, and I want to get to you, Nagar, to give the, uh, what you think the Iranians are thinking on this, but do you think a Biden uh, administration would be either wanting to or be under a lot of uh, political pressure at home, perhaps from some countries in the region, to expand the negotiations, not just to be on the nuclear uh, front, but also on other issues? Because you know, part of that question is, and I know others in, in the audience have asked, how is Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE going to react to a Biden administration trying to revive the JCPA, mindful of the absolutely instrumental role they have played in being the forefront of the opposition to the deal? Well, uh, to, to, you know, first of all, this question, would, would President Biden be under a tremendous amount of pressure to try to expand the scope of negotiations? Well, in my view, uh, in this case, President Biden, um, would have real pressure, both political pressure, but also US national security interests at stake to come up with a diplomatic strategy to approach Iran. And some of that diplomatic strategy is going to involve seeking negotiated agreements about points of mutual concern. And some of that diplomatic strategy is probably going to recognize that there are not areas that are, that are likely to reach agreement, um, but where we need to have um, uh, you know, sort of coalitions with allies and partners that allow us to resolve our national, our actual national security interests without the kind of constant escalatory tension that the Trump administration has created. So I think that there will be a real need for that from President Biden, and I think he will meet that need. Um, in terms of the regional actors, look, I'm, you know, it's going to be complicated, um, uh, but it is different from their perspective to deal with a newly elected President Biden and a President Obama entering his last year of office. And so, um, you know, while I suspect that a number of the actors that you've just mentioned would be unhappy having invested as much as they have in a Trump presidency to lose it, um, they're gonna have to come to terms with the reality of an incoming democratic administration. And I figure that they'll find a way to do so. Nagar, uh, can I ask the same question to you, but a little bit differently. If the Biden administration chooses not to immediately realign itself with the UN Security Council and says, you know, they need to have conversations, uh, perhaps even a, a negotiation, mindful of the amount of political capital that already has been depleted in favor of some form of an engagement with the US, how are the Iranians likely to react? And how are they likely to react prior to this? If the Biden administration signals that they're not just gonna do a straight rejoining, uh, perhaps that's not even possible and there's going to be some sort of a renegotiation. Is it likely that the Iranians are going to now start to build up their leverage before a January conversation with Biden, just as much as the U.S. has? I mean, the U.S. has far more sanctions on Iran than it even did prior to the negotiations. So are the Iranians going to expand their nuclear program, do other things in the region in order to strengthen their uh, uh, negotiation position? And can that process in of itself actually ruin the atmosphere and the prospects of getting a deal? Um, just to add to the point Jared was making, I agree, the Iranians have shown in the past two years that they're actually approaching this from a very pragmatic, um, with a very pragmatic stance. They haven't acted irrationally with the pullout of the US from the JCPOA. And there are two things that have been consistent in, I've interviewed the Iranian foreign minister, his deputy in the talks that are coming and the messaging from the foreign ministry is that they're going to continue maximum resistance in the face of maximum pressure. So if there's no change in US policy, be it whatever administration, regardless of the administration, that they're going to resist. But the other consistent point they continuously make is that they're prepared to return back to the JCPOA. They're prepared to continue negotiations, uh, basically pick up where they left within the framework of the JCPOA. And I think there are two um, 
positive, um, basically, scenario, positive points for the, for the Biden presidency. One is that the JCPOA already exists, so he doesn't have to negotiate from scratch like the Obama administration had to do. The framework can be there. They can just uh, literally go back to the table, sit down and negotiate. The other is that he will, Joe Biden will potentially become president while Rouhani is still in office. Joe Biden was part of the Obama administration. Rouhani was the administration that uh, negotiated. So all of these can make um, a lot of issues much smoother than if it was a different Iranian president or a different Democrat coming into the office. But the, um, the catch here is that the time frame is going to be very short because he wins, if he does win in November, he only comes into office in January and uh, the elections, upcoming elections, presidential elections in Iran are in May. So there will only be a few months left of a Rouhani administration coinciding with the Biden administration. And if things don't move into that direction, if basically his administration doesn't make it a priority, then it's very possible that we're gonna see a hardline president in Iran for another two terms, another eight years. And we all remember how it was under Ahmadinejad. There were negotiations, but you know the, the show of negotiations were there, but nothing really happened. And Biden is going to basically lose that chance for, for the rest of his presidency. Very interesting. Uh, we have a question from Ali Akhtisadi who says, how do you think the Biden administration will, re will design the long-term relationship between the U.S. and Iran after or if uh, rejoining the JCPOA? Uh, what's the long-term objective? And I want to put a bit of a twist on it and ask, what do you think the U.S.'s um, uh, lessons or the Biden uh, administration's lessons will be of the last couple of years in order to make sure that if there is a new deal or a rejoining of the deal, that it will be much more sustainable than what this one has been in the sense of making sure that it is not, you know, uh, political changes here or there, we're not going to be able to uh, rupture it in the way that it has been so far. And if it's not what they have learned, you know, what, what are the lessons we should be learning from it? And I want to start off with you, Jared, but also get your perspective on this, Barry, on what, how should we do this difference so that these agreements actually are not the, um, the subject of political wins in this country or any other country? Uh, you know, I, I guess maybe if I could separate into two kind of baskets this question. So let, let me start with the easy basket, which is, you know, what are the kinds of, what do we learn from this process that would be useful in negotiating a, a future set of issues with Iran? I think there's a great deal. I think that we've learned a lot about um, Iran's nuclear program and its concerns. Uh, we've, um, so my colleagues and I have put out ideas over a number of years about ways in which a future uh, sort of post-JCPOA nuclear arrangement with Iran could include some sort of bilateral or, or mini-lateral aspects that are focused on Iran, some regional aspects that address a variety of actors in the country's desire for a civil nuclear program, and then some wholly internationalized aspects by taking some of the best practices and lesson learned from the JCPOA and incorporating them into the IEA's overall inspection regime in a way that no longer sort of castigates um, Iran specifically. So I, I think there are a lot of things that we've gotten on that side. I think there's a lot that we've learned on the sanction side. Remember that when we were implementing the JCPOA, this idea of you know partial sanctions relief so that in, in exchange for uh, partial concessions from the target country, this is pretty new. And so I think we learned quite a bit about the ways that the private sector reacts to different sorts of US government levers that would allow us to make a pretty credible offer, a set of offer to the Iranians about things that um, they would like to see in their economy and that we might be willing to give in terms of, in, in exchange for further concessions. Um, that's the, that's kind of, an, that's, that's at least that's a sampler of the easy bit. The hard bit is the politics of this. And if I could tell you how to solve the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the polarization of American politics, I probably wouldn't be talking about Iran right now. I would be talking about, you know, the militarization of our streets or something that, having it said already, I don't think this is the most important issue. It's not where I would put my, my focus. So I, I think the fact is that the next U.S. administration and the world dealing with the next U.S. administration is going to have to find a variety of ways to come to grips with the polarization in American politics. There is not going to be some simple procedural solution to that problem it is going to take a lot of hard work and sometimes it's going to be successful and sometimes it's not. Barry, what do you think? I'm pessimistic. Uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, the, the point that Jared made a second ago is correct. I mean, American politics is very polarized. Um, it's hard to talk about 
um, you know, a President Biden's negotiating space without having a sense of how you think the election is going to go. Uh, if he gets the presidency by a squeaker and the Republicans keep the Senate and the Democrats keep the House, that's one world. If they can get, you know, a, a landslide, that's a different world. Then you could basically do things to get, you know, the Congress and the Senate on board. You'd have different, maybe different um, kinds of provisions in the agreement. Uh, you could sell a second phase of an agreement, maybe a little bit better. Uh, that would all be true, but you'd still have you know, the, the, an opposition there, and the opposition is going to paint you as a as a traitor. And we have, you know, two American people like to call them allies. I call them partners, I guess. You know, Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, who both have friends in the United States. Sometimes their friends overlap. Sometimes their friends don't overlap. Uh, but they're they're very uh, they're very much against a kind of normalization of relations between the United States and Iran. They don't want a war, I don't think, between the United States and Iran. They just want bad relations because bad relations mean the Americans and they're defending them and looking after them while they go about whatever their own business is, right? Um, so the, they're going to be active in our politics. Uh, their friends who are in our politics are going to be active against uh, the regime. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be very hard to pull off. Um, uh, are there things you could do? Probably. It would require a lot of patience. Um, are there things you're just going to have to look the other way on? Uh, you're, you're not good. I, I am very dubious that, that the whole security agenda that's been laid out with Iran is an agenda that can be negotiated. Right? I don't think Iran gives up its allies and proxies. Right? I wish they would give up some of them. I wish they would control them better, but I don't think they will. Uh, I don't think they're going to give up their intelligence operations. I don't think they're going to give up their missiles. I don't think they're going to give up developing their special operations capability. Right? And people are going to focus on those problems. You know, Our regional partners are going to focus on those problems, which Iran creates for them like a laser light. And they're going to bring those problems to the attention of Washington. And unless you have a pretty strong coalition for a very different policy in the Middle East and Persian Gulf, and by the way, there are plenty of people within the Democratic Party who themselves are quite hostile to Iran. So this is this is a this is a big lift. So I think sort of the I'm guessing, despite my own desires, that we back off our engagement with this region. You would need a, an unusually sagacious Biden team. Right to basically decide what can we negotiate with Iran, what can we not, what do we have to oppose at least symbolically, how do we discipline our partners, right? Do we bribe them? Do we spank them, right? How, how do we manage all those things at once, right? Well, making a larger point in the United States that you know, none of these people in the chorus should really be listened to very much because we have two big problems, America and China. And those are both really big problems in addition to the ones that, you know, the extra ones we're experiencing now, the COVID problem and, you know, lurking in the background climate change. I think the best you can do is sort of portray a kind of hierarchy of issues to the American people and keep saying, do we really want to put all those things aside to focus on whether or not the Iranians sent a certain amount of money to Hezbollah last week, whether they provided a certain amount of arms, right? If that's what they did and it annoys the Israelis, let's just send the Israelis another couple hundred million dollars and let them sort out their own answer, but not take all this upon ourselves. I, I, I think it's the best you can do. It's, I think, where Obama was drifting towards the end of his administration and hopefully the Biden administration will not be recaptured by the liberal world order people, and uh, they'll start with a more pragmatic policy. Thank you, Barry. We, we are running out of time, but a lot of people have asked questions on that very issue. And I want to pose it to Jared as, as your last comments that, you know, at the end of the day, some people are pointing out that, you know, Biden has a very good relationship uh, with Israel, has been quite pro-Israeli. At the same time, as Barry pointed out, you know, some of these countries, Saudi, UAE, and Israel, have an interest in not seeing this relationship between the United States and Iran improve. They need the U.S.'s support in their own quarrels. And they may be justified in their quarrels, but that's uh, uh, not the matter over here. In your perspective, 
given that, and I think Biden's team is quite you know, clear-eyed about what the situation is, do you think he's in a better position to be able to uh, insulate this from some of those pressure? Or do you think um, uh, it's just going to be even more difficult, mindful of the fact that the situation as a whole has become more problematic? Well, I mean, look, I, I think that the situation that, that, that Vice President Biden would inherit coming into the presidency is going to be worse across the board. I mean, we have four years of one of the historically worst presidencies in America. You know, this is, of course, he's going to have, I would have preferred to be taking over in 2017 than 2020. Um, you know, but but I, I really don't think that people should overstate the um uh, some of these speculative political complications, specifically regarding some of our regional partners. Um, you know, the fact is that vice, the vice president has, has said repeatedly what it, <coughs> what his policy toward Iran is going to be, or at least how it's going to begin, which is mutual recompliance with the JCPOA. And I think it's much more valuable to look at that than it is to kind of spin out ideas about ways in which people try, might try to use their influence. Quite frankly, after the ways in which they've overinvested in U.S domestic partisan politics. I think that the Israelis, the Saudis and others would be very, very foolish to welcome an incoming democratic administration in 2021 by going to war against what the candidate has said he intends to do. Um, and so I, I think that those are manageable problems and it will really come down to, I want to fully associate myself with Barry, it will really come down to whether or not you can correctly identify where does diplomacy mean negotiations with Iran? And where does diplomacy mean other non-military tools to address our national security concerns? And make sure that you keep those two separate, both in the way that you are addressing the problems and also quite frankly, in the way that you talk about them so that you don't give opponents sort of a cudgel to be able to say, but you said you were gonna get ballistic missiles when you knew all along that that wasn't really in the negotiation basket, it was in the other basket. Very good. Um, we've already uh, passed uh, our due time. Uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for all of you who joined via Zoom, via uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you to Barry, to Jared and Agar for a fantastic and very illuminating uh, conversation. It's clearly going to be very tough, but I think in some ways, when you take a look at the trajectory of U.S.-Iran relations 20 years from now, 30 years from now till today, I think it's become much, much clearer what actually is at stake, what is important, and what is not important. And hopefully, whether it's going to be a Trump II administration or a Biden administration, that they will take this into account and not overstate and overplay this issue. As always, before I let people go, I also want to just give a quick plug for uh, the panel discussions we will be having uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, on June 11th, we have a panel on QI's new report titled 19 Years Later, How to Wind Down the War on Terror by Stephen Simon and Richard Sikorsky. Um, panelists will include Stephen Simon himself, Ambassador Daniel Benjamin, Dr. Karen Greenberg, and it is going to be moderated by New York Times' Eric Schmidt. On June 17th, we will have a panel discussion titled The Liberal Order, Before Trump and After. Panelists will include QI fellow Patrick Porter, whose new book this conversation very much will center on, and that book is called The False Promise of Liberal Order. That conversation will also include Emma Ashford of the Cato Institute, Professor Michael Lind of the University of Texas, and it will be moderated by QI's own Stephen Vertheim. If you haven't already signed up for Quincy's mailing list, please do so. Go to quincyins.org. That way you will always get the notifications about our events, our publications, um, and you will not miss a single one of them. So thank you for joining us today and very much look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you.